Well, good morning again. Good to see you. Great to have you here. Those of you who are getting back to your seats, you may want to remember to grab one of these cups of communion. And if you, at this point, don't think you're going to, God, God willing, I'm going to teach about this this morning. And so at any point during the message, if you've forgotten or decide, hmm, I think I'll join in on this, feel free to get up there on trays there in the back, and you can take one of those at the end of my remarks, which Reggie says is about three hours from now. Um, it would be sooner if he hadn't talked so long, but, um, but, but at some point it'll, be, it'll probably be about 30 minutes from now, and we'll be taking communion and the Lord's Supper together, and you're welcome to join in with that. So, so just be aware of it. I got a couple of flashback things just to talk about first, though. Uh, if, if you weren't here last week, uh, you can go to our website and find that message, and this will make more sense to you. But last week, we talked about Jesus coming into Jerusalem riding the colt of a donkey. And I had some things to say about donkeys that were a bit disparaging. And I included a one-liner about dodges in there. Now, I knew that I had many wonderful friends who have Dodge trucks, and they are otherwise bright people. <laughs> and so far, they have had a sense of humor. What I didn't know was how many people we had with donkeys. <laughs> that was a surprise to me. In fact, there are two wonderful sisters here who have both a donkey and a Dodge. Oh, boy. So, so I felt like I alienated enough people out of respect for you, I drove a Jeep to church this morning, <laughs> which I actually feel like may combine the best traits of a Dodge and a donkey. You can determine whether that's a compliment or not. We'll see. Totally. So, so before we dive into God's word, let's, let's just have a little fun uh, with our neighbors to the north. Uh, um, you, know why, you know why Canadian cowboys have sticky feet? It's because of maple stirrups. <laughs> okay, that's a stretch, but whatever. So this morning we're going to go back to the, to the Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, and we're going to come to that event that actually we should be celebrating in, in the week coming up in a day called Monday Thursday, a uh, week leading to, up to Easter and the crucifixion. But we're, we're just taking this in steps so that that makes sense when we get there. And, and we're going to talk about an event known as the Last Supper. And it, it starts with an illusion that they are celebrating an event called the Passover. So the Last Supper event happened a little over 2,000 years ago. And I'm broad brushstrokes here now. And the Passover happened roughly 4,000 years ago. And I'm going to go back to 4,000 years and cover till present in three hours, 30 minutes. And so, so saddle up. Uh, let, let's, let's get moving. We're, we're going to go. Let's look at the scripture passage that talks about it. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Let me just pause right there and teach for a little bit. Back in ancient Israel's history, there was a point, you'll find it in the last part of the book of Genesis, when Joseph was sold into slavery by his jealous brothers, but he became the prime minister of Egypt. Oh, wow. And part of it was he oversaw seven years of bumper crops, and he filled barns and granaries and, and laid up store because he knew that there were seven years of severe drought coming. And sure enough, that happened. And when that happened, they had enough grain stored up to last them through that seven years. And other nations around them, Egypt was the sort of the premier nation, the superpower on the earth at that point. And other nations started to get hungry, including the family of Jacob, now called Israel. He had 11, J Joseph had 11 other brothers, his father Israel, Jacob, and they got hungry and they came down not knowing that Joseph was even alive yet or certainly prime minister. They came down looking for food and it's a fascinating story and, and, and they got food and eventually it wound up that they had a family reunion and the whole family 
all of these now 11 plus families came down and settled in the region of Goshen in Egypt, the best part. They were, they were farmers, sheep herders, ranchers, and, and so they were, they, and they prospered and they multiplied and it was great, but Joseph died and the Pharaoh was like the king of Egypt uh, that was with Joseph died and succession journeys and uh-oh, uh, now the Israelite people were definitely a threat and it came to be that they were first the workers and now they are the slaves of the rest of the Egyptians and yet they are still populating. They are thriving and becoming a really threat. So for a couple of hundred years or more they've been in slavery in Egypt and they're making bricks, among other things. They're doing, it's, it's, it's a terrible life in many ways, and yet they are prospering. This is during the time when Pharaoh said to the midwives of the Israeli people, uh, oh, if it's a boy baby born, we want you to kill that baby. And the midwives said nothing, but didn't obey. And later said, oh, you know, these, these Hebrew women are so hardy, they have babies before we get there, and uh, we just can't, we don't get there in time to kill the boys, which wasn't true, but uh, God was pleased with the fact that they weren't killing the boy babies, including a, a baby named Moses. And he would uh, become a the principal leader spokesperson for Israel and the great deliverer. And now, by the way, I'm going to tell you a number that I don't like. They've been in slavery for all this time. Now it's been 400 years since they came to Egypt for food, and God says it's time for delivery. I love God, and I respect God, but I wish he would hurry more than he does sometimes. You with me? I'm just saying the reality of God is that he doesn't follow my timetable. I've had numerous discussions with him about this, and it doesn't move him a bit. God gets ready when God gets ready. And, and so at the end of this incredibly long period of time, God said, I'm going to deliver my people. I'm raising up Moses, who will be the spokesperson deliverer for them. And God says to Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and you're going to ask Pharaoh to let all the Israelites go all of their flocks and herds, the households, everything go out into the desert to worship God for three days, and Pharaoh is going to catch on. That means you're not coming back, which was the plan. And so Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he said, not in this lifetime. No way, no how. I'm paraphrasing a bit. You will not find those words in Scripture, but that was the idea, no way, no how. And so, so, so Moses started doing miraculous signs. There were some enchanters in Israel or in, in Egypt who did some similar things. And then Moses started giving Pharaoh ultimatums. If you won't let the Israelites go, we're going to bring these plagues on, Ju on, on Egypt. It started really with the, the River Nile and all the water. Moses poured out a, a, a little bucket of the River Nile water and it turned to blood and the whole river turned to blood. The fish died. Um, it was an East Palestine, Ohio event kind of a thing over all of Egypt. All of the water everywhere was contaminated, uh, stinking, awful, and Pharaoh still hardened his heart. No, you can't go. Uh, the, where the Israelites lived, their water was still water. Uh, but, but Pharaoh repented enough that God then turned the water back into water. Then a succession of, of plagues, many of them. Uh, there were flies like you've never seen flies, amazing flies. One of them, I just think is kind of funny, there were frogs everywhere. Like, like God said, in your, in your bread bowls, there'll be frogs. In your bathroom, there'll be frogs. In your bed, there'll be frogs. There's just frogs, frogs everywhere. Now, I don't have anything particularly against frogs, but I've just never slept with one, so I don't know. I'm just saying, I, I just some, seems like not a cool idea. And God just says there's just frogs everywhere until, until Pharaoh said, okay, 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 enough frogs yet. Okay, you guys can go. And, and the frogs except for those in the Nile River, all went away. In fact, it says there were just mounds, huge mounds of frogs, there were that many that, that, that died. <laughs> That's not cool either. Um, and it was just a reminder. But then as soon as, as soon as the frogs died, Pharaoh says, nope, 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 change my mind, you can't go. It was that over and over again. It was one thing after another after another until it came down to sort of the ultimate end. And God is saying, I've had it. 
this is enough. I've demonstrated my great power, and now I'm going to come to a point where I'm going to have the ultimate judgment on Israel for all, or on Egypt for all of these years of having Israel in slavery, for all of this iniquity, for all of this hardness of heart. I'm going to have the, I'm going to take the firstborn. I'm going to have a death angel one night. I'm going to say when it's going to happen. And the firstborn of every family, and the firstborn of every cow, and the firstborn of every ewe, and the firstborn of every mare, I mean, the firstborn is going to die that night. But, he said, you in Israel, I'm going to spare you. Here's what you need to do to atone, to make up for, to pay for this firstborn. I want you, Israelites, I want you to have, first of all, it's a day of unleavened bread, but subsequently he would say, I want you for seven days to have no leavening, which is not a word you use a lot, I'm going to guess. It's yeast, basically. For seven days, I want you to have no yeast in your house. My wife made rolls yesterday. Oh, wow, they were good. And she used yeast. Thank you. I'm glad I don't live in ancient Israel, and I'm glad I'm not following the Passover right now because they, they, they were so much better than a thin, hard crust without them raising. You, you get the point? But for seven days, because yeast was a symbol of sin. Yeast was a symbol that it worked through everything and permeated everything. And, and so God is saying for seven days, I want you to clean your house. Absolutely no mold, spores, no yeast of any kind. And you only eat. And then, then, then when this event comes, you will only eat unleavened bread. So the day Jesus is celebrating this, by the way, a couple of days early. So, so when this day comes, you will have unleavened bread. Later, we have this cup, and on, on the top of it has this little chunk of bread, which we believe to be unleavened. There's even some of them back there marked gluten-free, which means it has pretty much nothing in it. So, so we're kind of following this, and it's the idea. And later, when you eat this bread, if you'll stop and taste it just a moment, you'll have a hard time doing that. It just doesn't have much taste. That's the, the, but the point is to say, this is not. This is. This is, without sin. This is without any of this, yeast stuff. Then they were to take a a, a, a lamb, needed to be the best lamb you have, about a year old, uh, perfect, blem without blemish. Don't call the herd. Don't get one that's 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 got problems. You get the best lamb that you have, and and you roast that lamb whole. You have a bowl of bitter herbs. And if that doesn't sound appetizing, you're correct. It was not and not intended to be. It was a symbol of the fact that you've been in bitter slavery all this time. It's a reminder to you that these bitter herbs, you have this, this paste of bitter herbs. And you have this whole roasted lamb and you have this unleavened bread. You were to eat this fully dressed, as a matter of fact, because they wore cloaks and stuff. You had your cloak on and a belt around it so you could really move out. You had sandals on your feet. You were to stand up, not recline or sit when you ate this meal. And you were to have a staff in your hand so, so the imagery is crystal clear. You're, you're ready to move out. You're ready to go. This is not a leisurely meal experience. This is something you are ready to move. And you were to do that on this night. But whoa, 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 whoa. forgot... Maybe the most important thing. Before you roasted this lamb, right outside your house, you cut this lamb's throat, you slaughtered this lamb, you took the blood, and you painted it on each doorpost and across the lintel on the top of your door. And God is saying, tonight my angel of death will come over the whole land of Egypt but when he sees on your door, your entrance, this blood, he will pass over you. That's how it gets the name of Passover. He will pass over you. It was the blood of the lamb. Now, if you're not catching on to significance and symbolism here, watch this. Jesus Christ is called the lamb of God. He is the 
The Bible says in one place, he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. Before anything got started in God's mind, Jesus had already been slain because he knew what was happening. He's the lamb of God. He's the perfect lamb of God without any kind of blemish. And his blood was shed for us. In this cup, there is juice that's going to represent the fact of his shed blood and his blood was shed for us. And God is saying, if that blood is applied to your life, my death angel will pass over you, won't land, won't stop. Your sin has been atoned. Wow. So all the Jewish parents did as, I mean, this, I've not even done all the details for you, but they did as instructed and that night 4,000 years ago the angel of death came over the land of Egypt but it passed over these homes where the blood was painted on the door doorways the rest of Egypt woke up wailing incredible mourning and Pharaoh finally said okay leave go and it was the marvelous exodus, deliver us, deliverance of, of the Israeli people on their way back to their homeland, their promised land. And God is, all of this is so full of symbols and metaphors and, and, and pointing us to Jesus Christ. It, it is pointing us to he who is the, 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 the center of this and here is the story we're reading now fast forward 2,000 years and Jesus is celebrating this event that the Jewish people have been celebrating each year for 2,000 years and still do and, and Jesus is this transition point to say this has been really all about me all of scripture and all of this is a point to who Jesus is in fact someone has said that history is really his story it's all it's it's about him and 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 he's the pen, the pivot point the focal point of human history and biblical history certainly so this passover brings us to this point let's let's read it jesus sent peter and john saying go and make preparations for us to eat the passover where do you want us to prepare for it they asked he replied as you enter the city a man carrying a jar of water will meet you follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, <laughs> by the way, imagine you're, you're a disciple. You're just walking into the city. You see a guy with a water jar. You start this conversation. Really? But, but back up. Just a short time ago, he, he told you to go in and just start untying a, a, a donkey. You'll be good, he said. You'll be good. Oh, boy. Tr following Jesus sometimes takes a lot of trust, I just got to tell you. But, but okay. The teacher asks, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He is saying, I'm here. I'm fulfilling this. That's awesome. Okay. So, so that just gives you a bit of context for the Passover that's leading up to this. Now let's go to the next section. And that is Holy Communion. Jesus is saying, I'm going to eat this with you, fulfill this. Now I'm going to initiate something else. And this is what we're going to celebrate and partake in this morning. So let's read the scripture surrounding that. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Let me just pause right there a moment. I've tried to imagine the emotion of Jesus who is saying to them in just several hours from now, I'm giving you this bread. I'm, 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 first of all, I'm giving you this cup, and this represents my blood. 
and it's just going to be poured out for you. Oh boy. And then I'm giving you this bread, and, and, and he would have taken a loaf, we think, and ripped off a chunk for them and saying, this is my flesh, this is my body that's being broken for you. Oh boy, when we, we think about this as a metaphor and a symbol in, in some ways, but this is like real time for him. Wow. And he's doing this, and, and then watch this, and he gave thanks doing this. He gave thanks doing this. He understood his mission. He understood his message. We're going to follow up next week and talk more about that, but I'm just saying he, he gave thanks, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's interesting. The crucifixion, resurrection hadn't happened yet, and yet he's already saying, this is what I want you to do in remembrance of of me. That's what we're going to do today. All right. Let's let's in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant, the new relationship in my blood which is poured out for you. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the next slide please. Now, I want to talk to you about communion, the Lord's Supper. We have, and if you don't have already, you can get at any point you want. If you're watching us, by the way, at home, I would recommend you get a piece of bread or a cracker and juice to represent this and, and uh, just go along with us. And I want to talk to you about some words that aren't in your normal vocabulary, and I'll try not to get, not to get in too deep weeds. And I'm going to mention a couple of denominations at least, and I mean no disrespect on them. I'm just going to talk to you about some different ideas as regards communion, the Lord's Supper. And I'm, again, not just doing this uh, 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 to, to expand your vocabulary. I'm, I'm going to do this because I think it makes a powerful point for us. Let's go back to say this. This is a word, transubstantiation. Don't say it quickly. Um, it's a big word, and it is a doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church who believe that when an ordained priest says a blessing, pronounces a blessing over the elements of communion, the bread and the wine, that those elements literally, physically become the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it is trans, is a transition, a transformation of the substance of that communion, those communion elements. I'm not saying that all Catholics believe that, but I'm saying that's their official doctrine, and, and I'm just using this as an illustration. Way back when, there was a Protestant Reformation led by Martin Luther, and some of you have a Lutheran background, and they went away from that literal, literal molecular structural change of these elements to something called consubstantiation, con meaning with. So instead of transformed into something, another substance, it is alongside another substance, consubstantiation, and that means that that when you partake of communion, you still have bread and you still have juice or wine, but you also are literally actually partaking of the physical body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Later, not much later, but in there, guys like Zwingli and others, um, Calvin and Wesley and Armin would, would come into what most of, of evangelical churches believe today and actually most others actually believe today is something called spiritual presence and that is that several minutes from now when I bless these elements they don't have a molecular physical change it stays bread and it stays juice in this case but when we take it in, we are taking in Christ 
in that his spiritual presence comes into our lives. This becomes a symbol and a metaphor of his body which was broken for us and his blood which was shed for us and therefore this comes into us and we realize Christ in our lives and the Passover occurs. God's judgment, God's wrath for our sins passes over us because the blood of Christ atones for our sins. Now you may want to go get one of those cups because I'm telling you this is, can be a really, really good thing. This is awesome. The, the, let, let, me, let me just go to the next slide because there are two things that I want to note with you. I've just explained to you some of the distinctive, some of the differences that is there, but I want to tell, talk to you about some of the similarities that are there. Whether you believe in transubstantiation or consubstantiation or spiritual presence, they each have this in common that they all say when we receive this, we receive Christ. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important. I really don't care. If you believe in transubstantiation, God bless you. I don't, but go for it. If you believe in consubstantiation, I think you're a half a bubble off still, but I'm okay. Go for it. Are, are you with me? If you believe in spiritual presence, aha, now I think you're, you're, you're on the level, but I, that's just, you understand, partly is the way I was raised too, and here's, here's what I want to say to you is, you can go to heaven believing any one of those. Amen? This, is, this, this unites us in Christ. This is, this is the fact that we are together with Christ. We, however it is you receive this, how, you've received Christ. I'm not trying to be all things to all people. Are, I'm, I'm wanting to say to you that it's amazing to me that this whole act of communion is designed, in fact, let's go to the next slide, is, is designed not to divide us, but to unite us. Part of communion is the word community. Part of, part of when we receive this together this morning because uh, uh, pretty much none of you belong to this or any other church in terms of membership, you're welcome to receive God's communion with us. Some of you have a Catholic background and may believe in, tra in transubstantiation. God bless you. Receive that today. Some of you may have a Lutheran background, may believe in consubstantiation. God bless you. Receive that with us today. Some of you are not sure what you believe about this, but... Believe me, when you receive this, you, you receive Christ. And one of the things that God says to us is that although we are an eclectic body of believers, we are united around the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We live in a world today that is often characterized as a highly polarized world. And sometimes it seems like to me people are just looking to find something to disagree about. Some of those disagreements are worth it. I don't say you need to agree with everybody about everything because I sure don't. Some of those disagreements are worth standing for, but we should agree about the person and work of Jesus Christ and what he does in our lives and how he brings us together as the body of Christ. So in just a few minutes, I'm going to invite you to take part in this communion service with, with me. I'm going to bless these elements. In my heart, I don't believe I have, I'm an ordained minister, but I don't believe I have the authority to say that they're going to change into the literal body and blood of Christ. I just don't think I have that much clout. But if you believe that, cool. Cool. But what I want you to believe is that when you receive this, you're not just taking a bit of tasteless bread and a bit of juice. Those are just symbols that help you receive Christ in your life. And when you receive Christ in your life, <laughs> you're good. This is a good thing. This is a really good thing. So join me in this. I'm going to peel off the top, put the juice down, the bread up. It's a really smart move. 
and I want to pray. Holy Father, in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we consecrate this bread and this juice to you and to us, and we consecrate ourselves to you so that in receiving this, we receive you, Jesus, and the work that you did for us. We pray this in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now please take that bread. On the night which was betrayed, Jesus took bread. When he had blessed it, he gave to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. then if you'll peel back that other portion of the cup that holds the juice after the supper he took the cup saying this is the new covenant of my blood which is shed for you drink this in remembrance of me Jesus, we receive you in our hearts and our lives. And now on the screen, we're going to have a copy of the Lord's Prayer. And I'd just like for you to pray it. If you need to keep your eyes open and read it, that's fine. Let's pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. God loves you. Go in the grace and the confidence and the courage that God has forgiven you. Amen.